the coronavirus. How are we to think about this from the perspective of biblical creation today on Creation Talk? So I'm Gary Bates. I'm here with Dr. Rob Carter, one of our biologists at CMI. First question, Rob, I think when most people hear the word virus, they think all viruses are bad things. So, you know, we understand when we read the book of Genesis, God created everything very good. Uh, We think viruses are bad. Did they have a pre-fall use or something like that? I mean, uh, colds, common colds are caused by viruses, for example. They're not nice. I love when people ask me this question because what I typically do is I take it and I flip it on its head. And I start off by saying almost all viruses are beneficial. Hmm, Almost all viruses are good. That's surprising. Yeah, and they said, what? Viruses cause sickness. You know, a few of them do. But most of the viruses in the world are beneficial to entire ecosystems, to people, uh, oceanic life. For instance, You've probably heard that we have more bacteria in our gut than we have cells in our body. Yeah, and tons of it on our skin. Yeah, we have more viruses in our body than we have bacteria. The viruses are there. They're controlling the number of bacteria. They're controlling the species of bacteria. So they are regulating the bacteria that without the viruses, the bacteria might eat us. I don't know what would happen if we had no viruses there, but it's, it's this delicate, beautiful balance where God created this system to work very nicely. And there's a lot of different species of viruses involved in this. Same thing's true in the ocean. There's lots of bacteria in the ocean. A bacterial soup. It's bacterial <laughs> soup, but there are more viruses than bacteria. Yeah. They're regulating the species of, of, of bacteria. So viruses are good. That's our starting point. Right. Something happened. So yeah, now happened. viruses are not living things in themselves, correct? Yeah. So they have to hijack the mach- m- machinery of the cell. Yeah, we don't define viruses as alive. They're li- literally like little machines that copy themselves and and go to other cells and get copied again. Right. So from the biblical creation aspect, I mean, there are lots of bad things that occurred in the world. I mean, we know that God brought, wrought a change on creation. Did he change viruses or how do you think... The, the change in viruses came about from the view of biblical history. What's your take on that? we got multiple different ways that bad viruses could emerge. First of all, we have to account for something that's called the fall. It's when, when Adam rebelled against God and God cursed the world. A very important passage in biblical Christianity, very important passage for theology, but also in biology. Once mm-hmm. we have this thing called the curse or the fall, we have sin, we have struggle, we have death, and we have things breaking. Go right, on. so viruses are originally good, mm-hmm. and we're talking about the coronavirus. It's obviously not good. So from the view of biblical history, we understand there was a fall, creation was affected. Uh, presumably viruses, did they change at that particular point? I mean, so when we're talking about the fall, this is Genesis chapter 3. Yep. Adam rebelled, God says, okay, you know, he's going to change the world basically as a reminder to us of our sin when things go wrong should be a reminder of what went wrong. And in fact, we can look at dangerous viruses like coronaviruses as a reminder of that. But ultimately, how did they change? What What's our best take on that? There are several different ways that viruses can change or emerge. One of the ways is um, if you just look at like a human cell, we produce a lot of very virus-like things. We make protein coats, we make RNA, DNA, we have all these Mm. little machines in there. And honestly, we we do a lot of virus-like things in our own body. So if you take that system that's already producing these things that are sort of virus-like, and maybe one thing breaks, or maybe um, a a mutation happens that prevents the body from being able to recognize it and doesn't know what to do with it, and the thing starts copying itself like crazy. So some viruses might have actually escaped from a designed cellular environment. That's really interesting. Hmm. I remember I read a, an article about that in our, our Journal of Creation a couple of years ago, and my mind exploded. I said, what? I had never heard of any of this before. What a really cool idea. What was it? So, Rob, people are talking about this particular coronavirus. What you yeah. just mentioned there was interesting, though they can escape, basically. So they're talking about the coronavirus actually jumping from another species. Yeah. We've seen bird flu, yeah. right, it's escaped from... 
um, from birds to humans. There's been the swine flu that has crossed over. They're suggesting this one may have come from bats. We don't really know. Yeah. So uh, this is a particularly interesting aspect. So viruses are not living things in themselves. They're machineries, and it looks like they can jump from one host to another. And that's when the problems start. Right. A lot of species host viruses that don't cause disease. Um, the classic one is, is influenza. Mm. If you look at ducks and geese and swans, they carry all the different possible strains of influenza. And those influenza viruses usually don't cause disease in the birds. In fact, if you ever go swimming in a lake, if that lake had had ducks in it, you're swimming amongst influenza viruses. Mm. But they can infect humans, usually. And they don't cause disease in the birds. So there's probably a good function of those in the birds that probably no one's ever looked so at. So do they have to mutate before they'll cause the illness in a human? Or is it just the fact that what's uh, you know, immunity is built up in one species transferring to another that is not immune? Well, immunity building up on one species is almost like an evolutionary argument. I think that they were created for some beneficial purpose. It's not like there's been millions of years of warfare between gotcha. ducks and the flu, and they've all you know decided yeah. to form a truce. Um, but they're created with a purpose. But a couple of mutations on the, the thing that recognizes the thing on the outside of a cell that the flu uses to grab onto to get into the cell, well, humans and ducks have different receptors. But if you change that receptor detector protein a little bit, all of a sudden it can grab onto a human. And so it can jump. It's called a zoonotic or yeah. zoonotic. That's zoo is in that word. It's a, a virus that jumps from one species to another. And those are bad because we don't have flu naturally. It's not part of humanity. And our bodies don't know how to regulate it apparently like a duck does. Mm. And so when it when it hops species, it burns hot, it burns fast, it causes lots of disease, it causes death. So we have Ebola, we have influenza, and we have now the coronavirus. Scientifically, these emerging viruses and the way you've just explained them, particularly crossing species, this is a real threat. It is absolutely a real threat. And it's happened multiple times in, in human history. I mean, the flu came from somewhere. Yeah. And it killed a lot of people. And other viruses also in ancient history. Yeah. Now, one thing I've uh, I've learned working with you is that uh, the fact is that some of these viruses can naturally burn themselves out. I think uh, you and Dr. John Sanford wrote an article in a secular journal, in fact, mm -hmm. about the Spanish flu, which killed millions and millions of people. More people died in 1917 and 18 from the flu than died in World War One. Yeah, which was a massive episode of death. So, but it actually went extinct. And actually, what you were saying in that article is the fact that it went extinct was a very, very strong argument against evolution. Why, just explain in a lay, lay perspective okay. for folks, if you can. The, let's say it this way. Influenza viruses is at war with the human immune system. Only the strongest viruses get passed on to the next person. In one sense, we would call that natural selection. Yeah. Very but, strong selection. Yeah, which is part of the creation model we don't have a problem with. That's right. But um, the mutations that occur, because influenza, the, the way it reproduces, it makes lots of errors. So lots of mutations happen in that DNA strand. But only a couple of those affect the thing that the human immune system can see. So most of the errors are accumulating in this virus and they're not subject to natural selection. So Spanish flu starts in 1917, sweeps across the world, and it's been in humanity ever since but it went extinct in 2009 after more than 10% of his genome had mutated. We call that genetic entropy. Mm. That is, you just apply the idea of entropy that everything falls apart over time to genetics and we can see it. Mutations accumulate too quickly and natural selection doesn't remove most of them. Because it can't see them, right? Because it can't see them. Right. Therefore, most species are doomed to extinction. And we actually wrote a computer model a couple of years before we did the study on the influenza genome itself, and mm -hmm. the, the two things matched up beautifully. And sure enough, extinction happened. In fact, we published the fact that the human, not the swine H1N1, but the human H1N1 influenza virus went extinct in 2009. The creationists noticed it. The evolutionary community had missed it. Now, it's a problem for evolution because what we're saying is genetic entropy. And by the way, we see that just in our genomes in every species we've looked at. Basically, uh, mutations are increasing in the populations around yeah. the world. But when we're talking about 
uh, viruses here, it's it's occurring within them as well, and that's why it's burned itself out so quickly. That that's the hope anyway, and we saw it in, in H1N1. I believe the same thing's happening in Ebola. Um, but we don't have enough data for Ebola. We don't have data going back to 1917. We have 1976. Yeah. And so, but but the the trajectory of the mutation curve is the same as in influenza. So hopefully Ebola will just disintegrate itself. That would be wonderful. Yeah. But it doesn't mean something else isn't going to pop up from somewhere else. Yeah. So you just raised another interesting point there. The Spanish flu, et cetera, um, was a pandemic. A pandemic yes. is when it goes across multiple countries, multiple continents. Yes. And many thousands or even millions die. We actually live with a pandemic every year. Yes, we do. It's called the flu. Mm -hmm. uh, in the US alone, uh, the CDC report that anywhere between 30 to nearly 50,000 people a year die in the US alone from the flu. Or the complications, usually the pneumonia that follows it. Yes, uh, and young and old people are obviously yeah. the ones uh, that, are at, that are at risk. And uh, of course, most of it is preventable. Uh, you know, at least stopping you dying, it won't stop you getting the flu with vaccinations. There okay, are no yeah. vaccinations currently for the coronavirus. No, but the, the influenza vaccination can prevent influenza. Every once in a while, they don't quite hit the right strain. Yeah. Uh, specifically, this year is one of the well, that's, that's ones. mutations as well, isn't it? Because Have, the yeah. southern hemisphere gets the flu before we do. We try to predict what it's going to be. But even by the time it comes from, say, Australia to the US, it can mutate. Mutate or a different strain can come up that they didn't see coming. Yeah. yeah so it's a, it's a very difficult proposition to protect and immunize against uh, diseases like this. Everything. Yeah. How do you how do you immunize against everything? But yeah. uh, the scary thing is what we've been talking about here, and we've said that viruses that jump species are dangerous. It could happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. It could happen anywhere. It could happen anywhere at any time. And uh, that should be a reminder to us, I think, of our, uh, our very precarious state on this planet. Which gives us an opportunity to preach the gospel to people. Because most people don't know anything about Jesus, don't know anything about mm -hmm. the future promises that Christians have, and the fact that we get to escape this world of suffering and death, and this is not all there is. I mean, things like this, people tend to, you know, let's hoard and let's buy a bunch of masks and let's, you know, hide in our little house. Now, this is the time to tell people about salvation. Mm -hmm. And people would say, you know, why does God allow these things to happen? Well, we live, as we said, in a cursed and fallen world. We go back to biblical history, Genesis chapter 3, and none of us are immune from that. Yeah. Whether you're in Christian service or not in Christian service, we're all affected by the fall, and we don't know when something like this might overtake us. That's why the Bible says today is the day of salvation, folks. And if you're watching this, you're not a Christian, I encourage you to place your hope in the only one who can save you. Our hope is not on this earth. Our hope is in the creator of this earth and in the future he's going to make a new heavens and earth that will be free of such things like mutated harmful viruses. Anything you want to say in closing, Rob? Amen. <laughs> Good place to finish.